what this what this is like. Um, some Indo food cake. Yeah, food cake. Oh, I get some food coloring agents taste like really powerful. Um, no. And I sell a perfume. Oh, that's gross. Yeah, that's not fun at all. <laughs> no. Okay. Um. Can somebody remind me tomorrow I need to give you your major assignment for the unit or for the chapter? And so uh, it's going to be due the day before the test. And I'll tell you when that is tomorrow. I'll figure out when that is tomorrow. But you you already have your review booklet, right? For what? Huh? For this chapter. Oh, okay. The chapter 5 review booklet. So like, you have... You have a checklist of all the things that we need to be able to know when we go through this booklet. Uh, the very first thing is going to be electrolytes. And, and uh, when we're talking about electrolytes, we already talked about them. Electrolytes are solutions that contain ions. What kind of solutions contain ions? Um, ionic. ionic solutions, right? So any ionic compounds. Acids also contain ions. What's the one ion in an acid that we really care about them? The hydrogen ion, right? So these will both be electrolytes. If you ever see an ionic thing or an acid thing, you know it's an electrolyte. And so when I look at an ionic compound, when I take sodium chloride, Let's draw a picture of sodium chloride. How many times have we drawn this picture so far? Um, a bajillion. When I, when I put this ionic compound in water, what happens is the water molecules slowly start peeling one ion off of here at a time. And that's because the water molecules, they're attracted to these ions. If the water molecules weren't attracted, then it wouldn't dissolve very well. So the water molecules are attracted, and they slowly start to peel off one ion at a time. And that's how we ended up, we end up getting these, we call them solvated ions. That's not important. But the ion is, is, is surrounded by water that's attracted to it. So if we have these ions, then we can get m charges moving around in our water. And if we have charges moving around in our water, isn't that basically the same thing as electricity, right? The flowing of charges. So, okay. Non-electrolytes are solutions that have no ions in them. Molecular compounds don't form ions in solutions, so they're not electrolytes. So here, when I have a big old molecule of sucrose, do you see any positive or negative charges inside that molecule? No. no. Okay. And if there were, they would be so close that they kind of cancel each other out. So there's no ions. There's no movement of ions, so it can't conduct electricity. Uh, it dissolves really well because of something that we're going to talk about in the very last unit. Sugar has the ability to do something called hydrogen bonding. Are you okay with that? And we will talk about it later. Classify each compound as an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte. Do you want to do this together or by yourself? Together. 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 Uh, okay, together. together. Fine. Sodium fluoride. Is it an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte? Non-electrolyte. I mean, electrolyte. Let's, I'll give you a hint. Let's write down the formula for it. What's the formula for sodium fluoride? Na. 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 F, right? So, <laughs> now. Is this thing ionic or molecular? It's ionic, so is it going to be an electrolyte? Yes. Yeah, this thing is going to be an electrolyte. What about sucrose or table sugar? Yeah, it's, it's, well, we already know that C12H22O11. Is this ionic? Does it begin with a metal or ammonium? 
Does it begin? It's a yes or no question. Does it begin with a metal harmonium, or does it not begin with a metal harmonium? Does not, right? So this is going to be a non-electrolyte. There's no ions in here for it to conduct electricity, so no, absolutely not. What about the next one? Calcium chloride. What's the formula for calcium chloride? Calcium is a 2 plus ion. Already we're talking about ions, right? Calcium is a 2 plus ion. Chloride's a 1 minus ion. So we need 2 chloride ions in order to balance it out. So this is going to be an electrolyte. What about ethanol? What's the formula for ethanol? <laughs> Did I ask you to know the formula for ethanol? Me. C2. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. C2HA. I mean, I mean. Oh, H. Ethanol is C2H5OH. Totally silently to yourself without saying any words. No saying any words. I want you to write down either the word electrolyte or non-electrolyte beside this. Go ahead, write down. Decide right now. What does your gut tell you? Is it an electrolyte or not an electrolyte? Neutral. Shh. Without telling you. Shh. If you're brave enough. Put up your hand and tell me, did you name it a non-electrolyte? Yes. Wrong. Did you call it an electrolyte? Yes. yes. No. Luke, your hand's kind of up. What's up? Wait, what? Uh, oh, okay. When? I an electrolyte. Is it an acid? It ends with OH, right? But it's not an acid. Why? <laughs> what do acids, just as a casual reminder, just as an aside, acids are either H something or something COOH. Is this H something? No. No. Is it something COOH? No. So it's not an acid. No. Is it a base? Yes. As another aside, bases, what do they have to be? Two things together. They have to be both of these two things in order to be a base. They have to be a group one or two, which means it has to be one of these metals, right? And hydroxide. That's the terrible hydroxide, but hopefully you get what I mean. Is this a group one or two hydroxide? Which, which, tell me which group one or two element is in C2H5OH? Is lithium in there? No. Is sodium in there? No. Is potassium in there? No. Is rubidium in there? No. Is cesium in no. there? No. Is brilliant in there? No. Is magnesium no. in there? No. Is calcium in there? No. Is strontium in there? No. Is barium in there? No. Are either francium or radium in there? Yeah. Well, they don't exist, so whatever. Um, so, I mean, what are we talking about? Is this thing a base? Yeah, what about hydrogen? What? Yeah, but that's not a, that's not a group one metal. Right? But, I'll, okay. In order for this to be a hydroxide and a group one, it has to be a positive one of these and a hydroxide. Let me be very clear. I've said this before, and I need you to pay attention to me. Hydrogen, yes, it's in group one. But hydrogen does not behave like a group one element. So we do not consider it to be a group one element. 
When I say group one, yes, hydrogen is under the group one heading. But if I said the group one elements, hydrogen is not a group one element. That's confusing and I understand that, okay? But think metals. Really when I'm saying group one, I'm thinking the alkaline metals, right? Is hydrogen an alkaline metal? No, it's not, okay? So, another way to think about this, just for a second. Another way to think about this is it has to be an ionic hydroxide. Is that more clear? It has to be a, an ionic hydroxide because any of these would make it ionic, right? They're all metals. But is there any metal in here? No, okay? So it's not an acid, it's not a base, so what is it? It's neutral, and is it ionic? No, it's neutral molecular. So this is going to be a non-electrolyte. I know we spent a lot of time on that, and I agree we spent a lot of time on that. I understand we spent a lot of time on it, but that's, that's okay, that's just the way it is. It's good for us to spend a lot of time on that. Solubility. Water is a polar molecule. What does that mean? Um, hey, does the Earth have different poles on it? Yes. Yes. What are the poles on the Earth? The North and South Poles. Okay. What does the word? Does anybody know what the word polar means? Sorry, I'm just singling you out, even though there's many people talking right now. What does the word polar mean? Peak. Peak. Pretty close, oh. kind of. Top, no, because, I mean, depending on your perspective, is the North Pole at the top of the world? Cold, maybe. Cold, no, it doesn't mean cold. Wim? Isn't it that like the opposite of each other, kind of like bipolar? Yeah, bipolar means two poles, two extremes, right? That's exactly right. So, calm down, Ms. Yes. <laughs> So a water molecule is polar. Shh. A water molecule is polar. What that means is that it's got a positive end and a negative end. What, what types of things are attracted to negative things? Positive. positive. So this end of the water molecule, it can attract other water molecules because they're attracted to each other from the different ends. So here I'll take two different water molecules, not different, but they're the same, right? And so when I look at this, okay, here's the top, the top is negatively charged, the bottom, both of these hydrogens are positively charged. And so what's attracted to that negative of the oxygen? The positive of the hydrogen, okay? And they're so attracted together that water, with the weight of water, how big it is, it shouldn't be a liquid at room temperature. And we'll get into that um, later on in the course. But okay, so water's got a negative end to it. What things are attracted, remind me, are uh, what things are attracted to negative stuff? Positive. positive stuff. And so when I look at this positive ion here, the negative part of water can attract that positive ion. The, po or the negative molecule or the negative ion here can be attracted by the positive ends of the water molecule. So because water is polar, it can rip apart these ionic compounds. It can dissociate them. And that's what determines whether or not something is going to be soluble. It's the interaction between water molecules and the ion. If the water molecules are really attracted to the ions, then it can rip it apart. If the water molecules are not so attracted to the ions, then maybe it can't rip it apart. So that's the idea. Um, perfect, yeah, we talked about that. Now let's just talk about endothermic and exothermic. I'm gonna do an analogy here. We're going to assume, we're going to assume that, I, I've got a stack of magnets here, okay? 
I've got a stack of magnets, and I'm gonna pass the room around here in a little bit. But um, in order for me to take these magnets, and in order for me to stick them onto the wall, what do I have to do to them first? No. In order for me, Idris, to take one of these magnets from the stack and throw it onto the wall, what do I have to do first? I have to separate them from the other stack of magnets, right? And then I can go ahead and I can toss these on here, whatever I want to do, right? Is, is the magnet attracted to the whiteboard? Yeah. Yeah. Is the magnet... Is the magnet attracted to the other magnets? Yeah. Yes. Okay? And it depends, it depends on how strong the attractions are between the magnets and the whiteboard. That will depend on how successfully they get ripped apart. This is the same thing as any ionic compound. I'm going to draw a really simple ionic compound, and I want you to draw it as well, please. Do you agree? Do you agree that that's about as simple of an ionic compound as I can draw? Mm -hmm. A couple positive ions and a couple negative ions. What are these positive ions attracted to? Negative. The negative ions. What are the negative ions attracted to? Positive. Positives. Okay. All right. Now, the positive and negative ions, are they attracted to anything else? When I put them in water, are they only attracted to each other, or are they attracted <coughs> to something else now as well? They're also attracted to water. Because water is polar, now there's other things that the ions can be attracted to. So let's think about this. When the compound starts to dissolve, these ionic bonds, just the positive negative attraction, they start to get broken. When I take this, when I take one of these magnets off of each other, it's like ripping an ion off of its stack of ionic friends. Do you think it's really easy for me to rip one of these off of each other? <coughs> no. Go ahead and try rip. Try to rip one magnet off of another magnet. It's really important you don't, I, I mean, I shouldn't have to say this, but don't take this magnet and like swipe it past your phone really quickly because it'll erase the memory on your phone. Okay. Yeah. So don't do that. Just keep it away. Just keep it away from your. Uh... Is it easy? And like, is it really, really, really easy? Is it so easy you could? You, yeah. But did it take any energy at all, Andy? I think it It took energy, right? It took effort to be able to rip them apart. Go ahead and pass it back. Pass it back so that other people can do it. In order to rip these ions, in order to rip these ions off of each other, it takes energy. It takes energy to rip these ions away from each other. So this takes a little bit of energy. When the water molecules So when these ions get ripped apart from each other, this requires a little bit of energy in. Sorry, energy in. Then the ions, once the ions get ripped off of this structure, then they can be attracted to water molecules. So these water molecules, they can be attracted to this thing. Now, does it take a lot of energy? This is going to be really hard for me. Does it take a lot of energy for the magnet to be attracted to the whiteboard? It takes no input energy at all. Okay. In fact, 
it actually releases energy when this happens. So this process, when the water molecules surround the ions, this is energy out. We actually release energy when this happens. It's the difference between these two processes that tells us if when I dissolve something, it's going to be endothermic, or if when I dissolve something, it's going to be exothermic. Do you remember talking about endothermic and exothermic? Yes. Yes. What does endothermic mean? It makes its surroundings colder because it's absorbing energy. So which process? Which process involved a greater energy change? If it was endothermic, did we have to put more energy into the system, or did we get more energy out of the system? We had to put more energy in. Okay, It must have stolen energy from the surroundings, and then when it released a little bit, it didn't release nearly as much as it did to begin with. Okay. So this is, this is the difference between endothermic and exothermic. Endothermic, and this is the last thing we'll talk about. Endothermic is more energy in than out. What that means is it, it absorbs more energy than it releases. Exothermic, I should have done it in different colors, but that's so fine. Exothermic is releasing energy, more energy than it is absorbing. So more energy out than in. Does the magnet analogy kind of make sense? It takes energy to rip things apart. It doesn't take energy to, uh, to let them be attracted to each other. Tomorrow we're going to start talking about these endothermic and exothermic reactions.